Hi, how are you? Good. Can you hear us okay? Perfectly. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. It's so lovely to see your face. Likewise. Lovely. Oh, my lovely. Okay, so just for people that do watch this, hopefully, um, this is our first podcast for Unified Artists for Freedom. We support and unify artists within the freedom movement, those who have walked through the fire to stand up and stand against the ongoing tyranny, propaganda and censorship of our times. Okay, my darling Emily, this is um, Francis. Hi Emily, how are you? He's uh, my right hand man when it comes to the tech stuff and also admin and just being a good, good friend at the moment. So listen, we'd like to hear more about what happened to you in 2020 in regards to the, the termination of your, your employment. Yes, it's very it's a very complicated situation, honestly. Um, I, I first noticed in 2009, to tell you the truth, um, that my colleagues were working against me and they, they worked very avidly for a very long time. They worked in the context of um, auditions for my flu section, for our flu section. Um, and um, <clears throat> in, the, in the context of uh, all kinds of things administrative, but also musical on stage. And, um, you know, <clears throat> we should um, just so clarify. what it told me sorry we should just clarify can you tell us um what you were doing first like what your oh, yes, yes, position yes. was so i <laughs> since 1988 i've been principal flute of the baltimore symphony orchestra in uh, maryland and uh it's it's regarded as one of the um last remaining major orchestras in the in the country of which um at last count there were 17 there used to be 35 so uh, little by little, um, orchestras closed as they lost funding. Um, but anyway, so the Baltimore Symphony um, started changing, you know, um, in 2000, early 2000s. Um, and <clears throat> so David Icke's um, phrase, the totalitarian tiptoe, um, has a, a very clear meaning for me <laughs> as I, I watched it and I, I fought it, you know. I So in... Um, in 2020, we shut down in the middle of March, um, uh, just as the rest of the country did. Um, we were performing Mahler's Third Symphony that weekend. We were gonna have principal bassoon auditions, canceled it all. Um, and then the following summer, we were talking about um, <clears throat> how to open in the fall amidst this lockdown. And um, we, had a, we had a Facebook page for internal dialogue and um, there were about 10 people out of 77 in the orchestra. This is sort of average for um, classical orchestras in the, in the country. There are about 10% of the orchestra or less that are outspoken. And um, I seem to be the only one uh, with my particular belief set, my particular value set. Um, and there were, there were, so with the vast majority of the orchestra saying silent, I can't really say if others, um, saw eye to eye with me. Um, but I'll tell you that when COVID came in um, and there was talk of vaccinations, I I understood my, my orchestra very differently from what I had believed it to be. Um, fear was the controlling factor, of course, as, as it has been generally speaking worldwide. But I was I was shocked to see how afraid people were to speak out on behalf of one of their own, especially considering we are unionized. You know, the American Federation of Musicians is supposed to be uh, protecting all of us from exploitation uh, by management. But it became more and more clear uh, over recent years during our contract negotiations, to me it became clear that um, the union was compromised and they were working for management and not for players. Um, and in fact, I, I spoke to um, um, a gentleman down in Alabama who runs an organization to uphold the Constitution. When I described to him the step-by-step -step motions uh, of my situation, he said, it sounds like you're infiltrated. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I mean, I was shocked by that idea as I was by the idea that there is genuine evil in the world. I, I had always recognized good versus bad, but evil was not in my perception, not in my reality, you know? And, uh, you know, so I've, I've been on a steep learning curve, needless to say. Um, and it was, it was when they wanted to mask society that I realized uh, 
communism was here. Mm. And um, oh my God. I started studying, you know, but, but what happened while well, I studied was that what I procured, you know, information from your friend, Sasha Stone, um, who I very much admire and who helped me immensely um, to awaken and um, to provide uh, valuable information to my employer. Um, I wanted to help to modify our safety, our so-called safety protocols. So when I when I learned what was um, lurking in the in the surgical masks that we were all supposed to wear, and that Johns Hopkins had created that nanotechnology that was embedded in it, and Johns Hopkins is here in Baltimore, and members of the Hopkins community, of course, are major donors for the orchestra. You know, I sent them a video describing. The dangers of the mask the content of the masks wow they would not open it the union would not open it the players committee representing the orchestra on behalf of the electoral of an arm of the union they would not open it i posted on facebook a um a video by uh, dr sam bailey from new zealand okay um who's, who's become very well known, I believe, um, as she partnered with uh, Andrew Kaufman and um, Tom Cowan on the Terrain Theory um, movie. Um, and uh, her movie was, her video, uh, sorry, it was more like a podcast. It was about uh, the PCR test, what it can do and what it cannot do. And, and in that particular juncture, I thought, well, this is really valuable. You know, people can look at this and then they can form a, an educated opinion about the PCR test. <clears throat> little, did, little did I know that, that that posting that on Facebook would become a tool to be used against me. Wow. Yes. And I also, um, on Facebook, openly, um, not questioned, I, I posted um, charts that had been done by computer analysts about our 2020 elections. And, um, you know, the sharp, the sharp line that went like this, you know, uh, in the in the Biden Trump, um, you know, switch. <laughs> I, I had just posted information, right? But I I became to be known as someone who was a you know, an election denier or whatever you call it. So, and then I also posted um, on Facebook. I I had to have a presence on Facebook when I was at the faculty at the Peabody Institute, which is part of the Johns Hopkins University system. Yes. And I had to have this Facebook presence in order to recruit students. So I used it as a tool uh, to communicate with the flute community or any classical musician out there because I viewed what was happening as a cultural revolution that needed to be truncated in any way possible uh, to save as many artists as possible um, because of our value to society. Um, and, can, you, um, can you describe I, for us what kind of uh, what you see as being the cultural revolution? The targeting of um, educators, the targeting of artists, um, the targeting very specifically of the orchestras here in this country. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, for example, the Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic. I just learned um, reinstated their mask mandates after having um, you know most of the orchestras had given up the mask mandates for at least a few months, if not the better part of a year. So they're back now. In Los Angeles, and so I, the way the orchestras work is there, there probably will be a cascade of other orchestras following suit because we're all overseen by an organization called the American Symphony Orchestra League, um, and often this this Symphony Orchestra League uh, trains management, and they come, you know, from from this training program into our orchestras, and then you know, so it it filters down. It filters down. They're all they're all thinking along the same lines, you know. It's, when you mentioned before that you thought um, the orchestra was infiltrated, what did you mean by that? And have, have you been able to find any evidence for that? Um, I, I think the evidence is the fact that we're, um, we're pursuing diversity, equity, and inclusion in these orchestras. And I learned from a former CIA uh, um, officer, Kevin Ship, that diversity is code word for the woke culture. Yes. See all around us. Yeah. Um, it, it was first evidence because our music director, uh, Marin Alsop, had twice conducted orchestra concerts at Davos two, year, two consecutive years. And it was when she came back from there that she started um, declaring that the, the Baltimore Symphony needed to do better, to look more like our community of Baltimore City. 
to look, not not to sound. No. So it's not based on merit. So we we needed to um, embrace more black musicians that we failed mm -hmm. to know. I I called my work my uh, employer out. Uh, this is an article that you read. It was reprinted yes. on Slip Disc. Yeah? Yes. This article had first appeared in the Baltimore Sun as sort of sort of an op ed, um, but I had I. Um, for my Facebook posts in uh, winter of 2020, 2021, I think it was. Yes, that had to have been it. So in those months, December, January, um, February, my employer decided to make an announcement on their Facebook page um, that they did not, um, that I didn't speak for them. My Facebook activity, my social media activity did not speak for them, nor did it comport with their code of um, ethics, um, which stood, which were compassion, respect. I, I can't remember the third thing. There were three things. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, um, there was no code of ethics, code of conduct, sorry, code of conduct. There was no existing code of conduct. It wasn't scheduled to be released until the following September at the opening of the next season. So, um, <laughs> um, and that was the first, that was the first blatant public lie um and that was february 13th um 2021 but uh the day before valentine's day oh, Emily. this announcement elicited 674 comments from the bso followers many of which were calling for me to be fired for wow. my facebook activity others calling me uh there were there was um subsequent to this announcement a uh, singer from the community who had been educated at the Peabody Institute um, published bits and pieces of an email that I had written in the summer of 2020 to my colleagues who had participated in a in a meeting, which I call the diversity, equity, and inclusion meeting. It wasn't supposed to be this, but it ended up being a discussion about how can we adjust our audition practices so that we uh, can get more black candidates in the final rounds. Mm. Now, when your resume screening is is blind, when your uh, preliminary round and semifinal round and first final round are also blind behind a screen, um, it it doesn't add up that you you can't advance knowingly black candidates. Asian candidates, white candidates, Native American, you can't advance them uh, knowingly. They either end up there by merit or they or they don't, or they were eliminated. Now, have many wonderful musicians been eliminated in earlier rounds and not made it to the finals? Absolutely. So you can also be eliminated even though you merit advancement. Um, but this push to, um, to see more black musicians in the Baltimore Symphony, I mean, we hadn't had many since I joined. I can count a violinist, um, ch a cellist, an oboist who was temporarily there, and uh, and a trumpeter. Uh, so that's four uh, black musicians since 1988 since I was there. And um, mm -hmm. at the at the time of this meeting, there was only one remaining, and uh, and the black uh, freelance community was rather outraged by this. Right, so they declared that. Our orchestra was not welcoming to black musicians. That's how they perceived it. Okay. And um, obviously, I knew this wasn't the case because there's no way to discriminate in a blind audition. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So that was that was one way it manifested. Uh, one very scary way. And then we had we had a lawyer representing us uh, during uh, the 2019 negotiations. We had a we had a 14 week lockout in 2019. And after six more months, basically, then we were locked down, right, uh, from COVID. Um, but we were trying to negotiate a, a contract uh, at that time, a collective bargaining agreement. And um, so what was the lockout? Lockdown. No, before uh, so the, the, we were locked out by our management over, over um, not agreeing to their terms of this collective bargaining agreement process. Uh, but also we had found funding from the state, which management uh, found a way to um, decline. 
that the state was ready to give us the major funding, that the musicians had, um, you know, rallied together on their own elbow grease and management had um, decided to cancel the summer season. And in so doing, I'm, I can't remember the details exactly, no, but there was something uh, linked to their cancellation of our summer season and locking us out that um, preempted this major gift from the state, at least delayed it quite a bit. And then, and then when the state um, was ready to give us the money, they had certain conditions they wanted to impose. So it was definitely government and business interfering with uh, our our collective bargaining process with the union, and um, and the union easily capitulating to um, to their demands. So when when it came to twenty twenty and the lockdown, how does your what's what's your story? What was your experience from then on in? Like what happened to you and. Um, and how did it manifest this this new regime of COVID? Yes. Well, I mean, we had to mask. We had to enter the building. We could only go to work after we'd had a PCR test, to, to a negative PCR test. When we got to um, work, we had to fill out a questionnaire about our, our whereabouts. Had we been exposed to anybody with COVID? Had we, you know, just knowingly come in contact? Had we been to any restaurants? Had we been following state guidelines? Um, had we been isolating at home? These kinds of things. Did we have a temperature? Had we recently been sick? Um, and then our temperature was taken, you know, uh, and logged in. Uh, and so then, and then you would follow a series of arrows through the concert hall, and you were given a a, a station, uh, either backstage or in the in the concert hall on the seats. Uh, where you could take your instrument out. And then once you had your instrument out, you had to go straight to your chair on stage. We were seated um, six feet apart at first, initially, and then again, it became eight feet apart. Wing players were situated eight feet apart and then 10 feet apart. And uh, management had done um, an, uh, an intensive study on airflow patterns in the concert hall. They'd gotten a new... Um, um, blower <laughs> and they they determined that the air was coming from the audience to the orchestra and up into the rafters this way so the audience was not in any danger whatsoever and you know wind players were um were the kiss of death for everybody everybody's terribly frightened of wind players because of the um i'm sorry the uh, transmission through airborne <sighs> particles you know that's insane because if anyone smoked a cigarette in the in the auditorium then you you, you presumably smell the smoke right Mm, absolutely yes, okay so yes but no there's no smoking indoors here yeah yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> so um at one point the the new mayor who is young black mayor, mayor of baltimore declared that no wind players could be in the, the concert hall even though the city doesn't own the concert hall did you ever have that um we, we saw lots of pictures going around at that time of people playing wind instruments with masks with maybe holes in it or gaps between the masks did they do anything like that no i mean thanks to the brass players we never had to uh, do anything as absurd as that we uh, we had to mask when we were counting rests but rests but then we could really? unmask while we were playing oh my god <laughs> but uh, even so i only was able to participate in three performances this way and they we didn't have an audience what we did was they they set the hall up for live streaming concerts and then they never live streamed what they did was they um they pre-recorded everything and then they uploaded it to their um, Facebook page yeah. and other, I think probably other platforms that I didn't participate in, but, um, you know, so we were, we'd spent a lot of money to equip the hall for live streaming and, and we never did it. And, uh, but I was, so in, so in February of 2021 is when I was rather excommunicated from, from everyone. And it meant by being, um, by being, told not to come to the concert hall apparently for any reason whatsoever not just for rehearsal um i um i was not able to talk to my fellow union members and the union was decapitated that way on for my on my behalf right because of you not because of me i didn't have access to union okay. support yeah. i was told by the there was a new uh Oh, you're gonna love this. Go on. I'm a new vice president of human resources. And when I, and I didn't notice this at first, when I went back and I looked at his introductory email to the orchestra, and he declared himself to be a global leader in human resources. He was there all of three weeks before he started issuing suspensions to me for my mm. 
So what? Theoretically not following, theoretically not following safety protocols. He declared that I was not wearing a mask. And I had always followed the safety protocols when I was there in the building. Although behind the scenes, I was advocating for an adjustment to our safety protocols for the health of the musicians. So he just, you know, did a nice little switcheroo. Mm. <laughs> um, so on the basis that I wasn't following safety protocols, that's why I was banned from the concert hall. And then um, over time, I learned that emails had gone out to the musicians that if they should see me wanting to come to a concert or trying to come into the stage door, that they should deny me access. Wow. Because in the in the summer of 2021, they cut off my uh, key card. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, so in March of that year, March 13th, 2021, I changed my political status and I became an American state national. This is something that David Icke has explored um, with uh, a Scottish fellow uh, over there in the UK, um, John, could his name be John Smith, maybe? And anyway, um, and uh, and Charlie Ward theoretically has changed his political status, and Donald Trump has theoretically a long, long time ago changed his political status. So what this means is you, you, you use the paperwork of the de facto government in order to revoke your U.S. citizenship, because when you are um, a U.S. citizen, you are, um, you are a, a slave of the corporate government. Right. Um, yes. You are not a free American. So what I did was I expatriated from that corporate system. So you've done the whole the whole thing. The and so wow, yeah. is it a long process? Is it difficult? It it can. I mean, there's quite a bit of paperwork, and you have to send everything, you know, by priority mail, return signature, hopefully. And they they never send. I mean, you never get the the green signature card back yeah. because they basically just ignore everything that that you do. <laughs> yes. But you know, people were the public was saying, you know, Emily's so foolish she thinks she has constitutional protections but she doesn't not in the workplace you know and this mm. is another evidence of the totalitarianism right mm. the fascist um we have a fascist society where corporations rule yeah absolutely the quality of life yeah so in um just to clarify the chronology here so march 2020 lockdown all these crazy rules get put in and then um by the time it gets to february and march 2021 and um, they are basically excommunicating you from the orchestra but what had happened in between those is it just your because they made a facebook post what, what did you done to provoke this or come to their attention put a video yeah oh well um so in the summer of 2020 after we'd been locked down you know we had this diversity and equity and inclusion meeting and um so the community members were talking about um basically how discriminatory the members of the of the orchestra were that we didn't have more uh people of color there yeah um, and I wrote this uh, article, this op-ed, um, I had written it the preceding, so March of 2020, I had written it, um, where I was, because I, we were already talking about DEI for some time. And this article, I said, look, we have an orchestra of 77 people. We have 37 underrepresented um, individuals, but people from underrepresented races um, or cultures, I would say, because we're all from a human race, but um, 37 underrepresented individuals women, Asians, uh, Native American, uh, Hispanics, Black, um, you know, and then we just hired a Black narrator and a Black conductor, assistant conductor, and now we have a Black music director. Um, so um, I had called out the orchestra on this fallacy that we, that we were doing very well with 37 out of 77, hmm. and that that had increased a great number since 1988. You know, unlike well, some commentary um, was misleading us to think. So I had written that letter that had been posted and published in the Baltimore Sun paper. And then um, the following July, we had this diversity, equity, inclusion meeting. And I, I was giving feedback um, about how I disagreed that our, our audition procedures were tainted in any way whatsoever, um, that the resulting lack of black musicians was um, not by way of our, our procedures, you know, and that everybody on stage had lost more auditions than they'd won. You know, it's very difficult for anybody of any race to win an orchestra audition. Mm. Fewer than 1% in, in the 1983, the director of the Eastman School of Music announced to everybody that um, fewer than 1% of all musicians who are members of the American Federation of Musicians 
musicians are actually employed in symphony orchestras, fewer than 1%. So you can imagine how many musicians are losing auditions of, of all backgrounds. Um, so I argued that I myself also had experienced discrimination as a, a white woman. And I just experienced discrimination since I began my career in the early 80s, mm -hmm. all the way through, constant discrimination. So I, I was trying to point out that discrimination wasn't exclusive to the, to the black race. And I was trying to point also to the fallacy of racism in America. Mm. I, I also, uh, I pushed all the triggers apparently. I mean, cause I, I called out BLM. Yeah. <laughs> I called out DEI. I called out the elections. I called out the PCR tests. I called out, I came out strongly and I said, the, v the vaccines are dangerous. I said that in, in uh, 2020, I, I said, they're dangerous. Please don't get them. Yes. And in all categories, I, I, separated myself from the rest of my colleagues in the orchestra. Yeah. Oh dear. And and um so you did this. I I saw that uh slip disc has an audience of two million people around the world. <laughs> so your 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 opinion pieces or your your writing in that is spectacular. It's a wonderful piece. Yeah. I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed reading it. Thank you for that Emily. Yeah it was very an, an inspiring to read that you had been so um, open and honest, really. Like, because people are slightly cowed, and they 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 talk around the subject. You just nailed everything, bang on. Yeah, and that... just pure truth. Yeah, pure <laughs> truth. You know, speaking your truth. And so, how how are you? What's going on with you now? What the what are you up to now, Emily? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, right now I am I am working again as of last June, but only as a teacher's aide for a, a Montessori school for okay. early it's early childhood learning. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm making maybe twenty five percent of what I used to make in the orchestra. Yeah. Um. Yeah, scraping by for a large part of last year, I was unemployed and I was living off of the good graces of my friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you were you were in the orchestra for thirty three years as well, right? Is that right? I yeah. was. I was, and it wasn't my first orchestra job. So I'd been in orchestras since, yeah. uh, since I graduated conservatory in 1983. And, and was the final straw there just, um, it, it, how did that actually happen, the last thing? Because I read something about the key card. Yeah, the, yeah. So because I had changed my political status and become a free American, I was resubmitting my W-4 forms. So these are the taxation forms. So I had opted out of federal taxes and I needed to um, mark myself exempt on the W-4. And so I I didn't have any money at that time for postage, okay. but I had gas in the car. Yeah. <laughs> and I decided I better drive that form down before the next payday and uh, and hand it to the security guard and ask him if he'd be so kind as to take it down to payroll. Well, when I arrived at the door, I learned that my key card had been disengaged. Okay. And I the security guard saw me and rather than and we had been great friends, you know, we had a very cordial relationship, but rather than come out and greet me and see what I needed, he called management from down from the offices wow. and intercept me. And I, um, I asked, you know, I, they came out of the building, right? I, I wasn't allowed in the building. I stepped back from them because I was, they were all, they were both wearing masks. And uh, I stepped back from them because I realized how frightened they were of me. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And I said, you know that um, you know that the pandemic's been over since March of 2020, since exactly when it started. The pandemic's been over, and the CDC has mentioned of this on their website. And I, I said, you should go well, look it up. You know, the pandemic's over. You don't you don't need those masks. I said, and of course they were, you know, <laughs> they were like, we're not here to discuss the pandemic with you. We're not here to discuss masks with you. You know, what what do you need? So I I gave them my form. You know. And I asked if they'd take it down to payroll. They never answered me. They went back inside. They hid behind the, the wall in front of the elevator. Clearly, I guess they were, they were either going up to their offices or down to payroll. I didn't know which. I knocked on the door with my knuckle. And they thought I was banging on the door violently. And, um, you know, the glass door <laughs> um, amplifies the sound of the, the knuckle hitting it. So, I mean, maybe it sounded loud to them, but they were also just fearful. They were so afraid. Anyway, they never answered me, and I got um, I got angry with them, and I <laughs> I cussed at them, mm. basically, and that's why I was fired because I tried to tried to enter the building that day. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little bit like it could have been 
you know, set up for that eventuality. Yeah, when they were working toward it. I mean, I'd already been suspended for five weeks without pay between mm -hmm. March and August in 2021. I was fired on August 3rd, 2021. And they had made this whole um, narrative of theirs that I wasn't following safety code. Okay. So we have, we've, um, it's just told us that we've only got about 10 minutes left. So like, I'd like to uh, just move on a bit to what, what, what can you, what have you learned or anything positive you can tell us about this experience that, that, cause it's been, sounds like it's been horrendous and you've like lost the, this principle. Is there anything good come out of it for you or no? I mean, I think I, I've done a few podcasts yeah. um, to me. Oh, that's good. There's also um, a group of more than a hundred musicians that are on a chat um group um that i belong to most most of whom are unvaccinated so there's been a collegial um unification of people okay lovely that's right good to know involved. um and now i've found you you're united oh Arizona. wonderful I'm well i grateful for. and i'm i'm i have my plans to start an orchestra for unvaccinated musicians brilliant this yeah. is great this is great <laughs> this is wonderful this is the way forward i think for us all it's so important now to really emphasize where we focus our attention are we going to put it on the old system that's obviously crumbling down we have faith that it is you know and build this new way of living and and putting up with this crap basically so i think that's wonderful what's the stages what stage are you in i'm it's really planning stages you know and because i've changed my political status this new orchestra will run under common law it won't run under maritime or admiralty or ucc law right um, and so if there are any future mandates in, in, you know, coming down the pike, it would not be enforceable for us. Excellent. That's brilliant. Yeah. And have you learned all about this in the past year or two about uh, Admiralty Law and Maritime Law? Yes, I have. Wow. <laughs> yes, <I'm> studying. <laughs> and it's been, oh, it's been such a trajectory of, you know, upward trajectory of, of learning of, of, on all topics. Um, I have been I've always considered myself a perpetual student, but never more avid a student than I am right now. So focused. Yeah. Well, it's survival. We're trying to survive, you know, with the odds against us. I mean, for me, there was no doubt I had to be truthful. I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't be in that job with a bunch of colleagues that were coming down at me with all of this, this fervor, which is which is a sign of their brainwashing. Their the you know they've been thoroughly propagandized. Yeah. I I was so shocked because I thought that the arts were a sort of protected enclave in society. I could not have been more wrong um, about anything. Um, so the awakening was harsh for yeah. me, and and being unemployed and and alone and isolated um, in in from August twenty twenty one to June of twenty twenty two was extremely difficult did nobody call you did not did with none of your um there's one person from the orchestra that stayed loosely in touch uh and well and then um so well, there were two people let's say there were two people from the orchestra that stayed loosely in touch but one wasn't technically an orchestra musician um but rather on the staff and um yeah but not very often and so there were no social engagements wow. there was um you know i mean i i my my colleagues were so hateful toward me that they um they insisted I had been down in Washington DC for the January 20, the January 6th uh, insurrection, you know, and that I was, they just, they had to call me every name under the book, honestly. Um, it was, I, and I couldn't believe it because I, I've never portrayed myself to be um, rebellious like that. No. You know? yeah. Although in spirit, I'm definitely rebellious, yeah. but not, not so outwardly. You no. know? So their interpretation of me, I always felt, I felt misunderstood for a very long time. And mm -hmm. so now I, uh, all the pieces have come into place. I it understand. Sense. It makes I understand. Sense. You know, the infiltration happened a long time ago, and it's you know it's that that classic analogy of the frog and the boiling pot of water. Uh, we could not we could not feel it. And when when that mask mandate came in, I, I said, you know, we are not China, not yet. No. I'm not playing this game. Oh, wonderful man! Wonderful. Thank you. Um, what um sort of ideas or like people have been keeping you going then like do you have a philosophy that you rely on when things are tough or or anybody around you that you can lean on wow that's a very good question i mean mm -hmm. i have a daughter in her mid-20s i don't see her often enough okay i have <laughs> i don't have much except my faith 
Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't. I just have my faith. I, I have to follow truth and have to follow God and know that He'll protect me. Bless you, bless you, and, it, and hopefully, you know, if you set up your own orchestra, then good things will come of this. You know, we'll have to be coming over to Baltimore, man. <laughs> we'll have to come and see you on opening night. I don't know if I can do it here in Baltimore. I think I'm gonna have to relocate for this. Really? Wow. Fly in for, for yeah. I don't. I don't know that uh, Maryland is the right state for this. Okay. Season. Okay. Um, Maryland outwardly is still a very blue state. Okay. Right. Even though the elections of 2020 showed the whole country, but one state being red. Um, that was brief. A brief foray into the <laughs> into the okay. red. State, yes. Um, but no, I, I think it would have to be done in, you know, Florida or Texas. Or okay, yes, of course. One of the other states, uh, maybe somewhere out west. But hopefully some musicians will see this and uh, join the, uh, yeah. the new orchestra of freedom. I mean, that's, I, mean I made friends. I, I didn't say that, but I, of course, from, from the Facebook posting, I had people reach out from all over, from South Africa, from Chile, from Excellent. Poland. You know, I, I had friends from everywhere. I'm in contact with somebody in China now. The, I, I didn't tell you this, but um, when the day I was fired, the news was in the international newspapers, and I found out that even in you know uh, Manchuria, China, wow. China yeah. they wow. had the Chinese, you know, uh, um, sorry, it's okay translation of of everything, and it was in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the the Daily Mail. There are two articles in the Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. There, um, the Guardian. It was. Everywhere. We saw them. We saw and, them. Um, yeah, and it was. I'm. I was the poster child for musicians yeah. who should comply. Total scapegoat. Total scapegoat. Well, Emily, we're going to have to uh, call this one to an end. I want to thank you. It means so much to us personally because um, you know this was the only way we could like transmute and transcend our frustra frustration and anger into something positive. So to connect with you and to hear your story, we thank you for sharing. We thank you for your courage. Yes. And we're definitely going to keep on in touch. Definitely going to keep in touch. And you have my number. You know, you always will we'll, we'll keep in touch as we do. And um, yeah, I want to thank you for being our first guest. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm so honored. Thank you, you so, so much to us. I just, I'm so, I'm, I'm so proud of you for, for organizing this United Artists for Freedom. Um, and uh, I just, I can't wait for our next, you know, joint yeah. effort. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I, I just want to say again, the um, the way you wrote and that those articles in Slip Disc, I think I urge anybody who watches this to, to read them because yeah. that's like an inspiration in how to tell the truth to people. Yeah, we're we're going to put the link underneath this this video. We need more people yeah. like you. Doing we need that. so many more people like you. OK, Emily, we're going to say goodbye. All right, thank you. So Sarah. much love. Thank God you bless much. you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.